verse uh, today. Hallelujah. Praise God. We've been looking at the kingdom parables. And the first parable is that of the sower. And we've looked at the setting and the reasons why Jesus spoke in parables. And we begin to see the action of the sower as he goes forth to sow seeds and how the sun fell on uh, the wayside by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured them up. And our last lesson covered that aspect of it. Aren't you glad you know the Lord this morning, saints? Yes. Praise God. What a beautiful sense and presence of the Lord here in this place. Praise God. I pray that you may keep your hearts open and receptive this morning. I believe God wants to do some good things amongst us today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Alright, so the sower sows seed and as he does, some fall on the hard ground. We've covered that and we've seen how that this is a condition of heart that's terrible because it needs to be plowed out. But there is a solution to this condition. Fallow ground can be opened up. Hardened ground can be restored. It can be once again rendered soft and so forth. But there needs to be some work done. And we analyze our own hearts as we study these uh, these first few verses to make sure that our hearts are not hardened, for it can happen ever so easily. Jesus completed that verse by saying, And the fowls came and devoured them up, devoured those seeds. Uh, Jesus explained in, in his explanation of the parables that these fowls are representative of the devil who capitalizes on this heart condition. He seems to recognize when a heart is hardened and he quickly takes away any seed of God's word that could possibly give it life. He doesn't waste any time. When the heart is hardened, those seeds bounce off. They sit on top. They're exposed. They're not hidden. They're not in soft ground that where they can grow. And so they quickly are removed uh, by the devil. Jesus said that Satan quickly steals away these seeds and any potential life with it. And so it's so vital, isn't it, that we keep our hearts tender. I pray that in the past week or two since we've studied this, that you have made a point of analyzing your heart in prayer. And if you've found any hard spots, any unplowed areas, that you've allowed the Spirit of God to plow you up so that uh, you can be uh, ready for the seeds of God's Word. Spurgeon said, like a meal undigested, the, and la the lack of understanding and comprehension of the value of God's Word causes the seeds to be lost to other thoughts, other desires, other affections, other distractions. And he's spot on, isn't he? As, uh, as he makes that comment, he says, it's just like a meal undigested. The seeds just sit on the ground. They're not covered. They're not taken in. They're not appreciated. And so they're lost. They're lost to other thoughts, desires, affections, and distractions. We need to be so careful in our walk with God's saints. We are saved, but it is a conditional salvation. We must remember that. It is conditional on our remaining close to God, remaining faithful until the end, remaining undistracted in our purchase of heaven, in our walk towards heaven, uh, it, remaining un undeterred by other affections, and remaining empty of other desires, so that we can remain full of the desires of God. And it starts all in the mind. That's where we begin to think differently. Our thoughts stray at times, and just as they do, as we stray away from the things of God, so does the goodness that God wants to put in us is lost. And so the imagery that is used by the Lord, these, these fowls of the air, is very appropriate, isn't it? Well, what do you think about when you think of fowls of the air? What, why is it appropriate in the context of this, of this verse? Hard ground, seeds on top, and then the fowls come and devour it up. But why is it so appropriate that Jesus used birds, fowls of the air, to depict the taking away of these seeds? What's significant about fowls, or birds if you please? Yes, Brother Bill, what would you say? Maybe it's because they're so swift, brother, they just come down very swiftly. Very out swiftly. Pick yeah. up just a little bit, yeah. but there's lots of them. Lots of them, that's and right. Next minute there's none left. Now they've got a, a single beak, you know, like it can only pick up one thing at a time. They can't hold two things at a time usually. They drop one. But they're so swift, and there's so many of them. I remember at the, at the farm when we were digging away and making roads and so forth, we would dig, the, the, the ground that had been compacted so hard would be pl 
plowed up by, by the digging as well in turn and of course we would expose bugs which to our, my human eyes were invisible. I couldn't see them. But those birds would sit about, particularly the kookaburras, would sit waiting on the trees nearby and then they would swoop down and pick up those, those grubs and they saw them and they had a feast and it was constant. There was dozens of them doing the same thing. The fowls of the air do exactly that. They're swift. They may only pick one seed up at a time, but there's lots of them. And so that's why the plural fowls of the air, very swift, and I guess it's a, an appropriate imagery. Uh, they are, in that uh, sense, quick and speedy, and it's an apt illustration, because not only that, they are quite voracious. Birds can eat quite a lot. I saw once a picture of what a canary eats over a year. It is fascinating, the amount of seed that a single little canary can put away in a year. It, I forget now the quantities I want to attempt to, but look it up. It's, it's particularly interesting what one bird can eat by way of seeds and other things in just one year. Of course, it's a small bird, but it can put away a lot of food. So they are voracious little animals, and uh, they're also uh, sudden of action. As we said, they swoop down for the food. and So it, this is what characterizes birds in the wild, and so it's an apt illustration. And it is sad that uh, we too, as believers... Uh, can no sooner receive a good message from God's Word, some life-giving, some life-changing, life-improving teaching or concept or, or, or uh, principle. And instead of hiding it in our hearts, instead of burying it deep and making it ours and rejoicing over and making it grow, unfortunately, uh, or, or even reviewing it later you know, and remembering it in that sense, unfortunately at times at least we allow it to be quickly stolen by the mundane thoughts of life, by the distraction of our activities, by the things that, that permeate other aspects of our life, and also the nature of our choices. Sometimes it's the thoughts or ideas of other people that steal from our hearts the good things that God has put there. Has that ever happened to you? You know that something is good, something real, and you've received it, but then you go and listen to someone else. And it's sort of like they plant another seed. And for whatever reason, that seed takes over from the seed that's been planted already. It just sort of robs you of what you've had. Be careful of that. The Bible did warn us that we're not to be spoiled through what? Philosophy? And what? And vain deceits. Yeah, okay. Or the philosophy of man after the rudiments of the flesh. In other words, there are a lot of people out there disseminating all sorts of ideas and all too often they will take over, if you please, the very good things of God. It's interesting how weeds always take over and t seem to grow quicker and faster than, than good seed. And so we've got to be careful of that. All right then, make sure that what you have received, what you receive from God, you hide deep into your heart. The psalmist, I believe, said that, Thy word have I hidden, have I buried in my heart, that I will not sin against you. It's a beautiful desire to hide the word of God in our hearts, not to hide it so that we don't see it, don't use it, but rather so that we remember it and review it and we don't allow it to be stolen. There's a, a beautiful scripture and it's a very sobering one. And it says this, it says, uh, you know, the, the Lord is coming quickly. Let no man take your crown. There is something precious that God gives you when you know Him and it can be stolen, it can be taken away, it can be removed from our possession. Don't let anyone do that to you. God's Word, the salvation you've received is so precious. Don't let the mundane thoughts of life take it over or destroy it. Don't let the distractions of your activities take over or destroy it. Don't let the nature of your choices or the thoughts of other people, ideas of other people, remove or take away that seed. Now, if I had a fruit tree, and I guess maybe you've had one such circumstance, uh, and and there was, you know, there, there's this sort of fruit growing on it, but I know the birds are going to get it. What would I do, do you think, to, to protect my tree? What could I do to keep the birds from getting at the fruit? What what is done? What is the normal thing to do, Kathy? What would you say? You cover it with a net. Is that what you would think? That would be a, a fair attempt at at sort of protection. Birds don't normally fly under a net because they know they're going to get caught and snared. They tend to fly sort of on top of things and don't normally fly under. Uh, they're clever that way. 
Now, we have seen many fruit trees destroyed this way, where plentiful fruit, fruit growing, but by the time the fruit is mature, it's either all pecked at, or it's been dropped, or it's been got at, and certainly there is nothing worth eating anymore. Now, that's true of, of a tree, a fruit tree, and what we would do to protect it is that we would cover it. And I want you to think of that concept, to cover it. To cover it means to want to safeguard it. Uh, you cover what you want to safeguard. You cover your bodies because you want to safeguard them. You cover things that you don't want to get wet or spoiled or ruined. Most people cover things that don't want to get dusty and so forth. We cover things. We cover them not so much to hide them, but just to protect them. And I think that that's really what we're talking about here. God's Word is so valuable. It is so precious that it must be covered. The birds will get it otherwise. Just like that net over the tree, the same covering and protective attitude or approach should be taken to keep and to safeguard God's Word in our hearts. So, please remember this. Just because you've heard it doesn't mean that you've covered it. Okay? Just because you've been to church and some words have been spoken into your ears doesn't mean that it's got into your heart and that it has been covered there and protected and kept. That's an action that's separate again. Just because the fruit is growing on the tree doesn't mean it's covered. And so what do we have to do? It's a separate action. We have to consciously protect that word. Make sure that we do not allow it to be taken from us. If God gave it to me, it must be good. It must be precious. Let me keep it. Let me cover it. It's a separate action. It's a conscious action. And it's an action that's born with this attitude of protection and safeguarding. Now let me ask you something, when was the last time that after you've heard a message that touched your heart and you know God's Word touches you, that you thought to yourself, you know, I'm not going to lose that, I'm going to keep that, I'm going to protect that, I'm going to meditate on that, I'm going to review that, I'm going to keep it in my heart. Chances are, if you didn't do that action, that that day, the next day, the next week, you won't remember, it's, it will have gone, it will have dissipated, it will have been stolen. And that principle that looks so great and so so very meaningful at the time has no longer the same impact. Sorry, Brother Ian, I saw you. Over the years I've found, you know, like that, that principle that you instilled within us, but even coming to church, not starting from before church, but even on the Saturday, Saturday night, and I just said this this morning to you, go, our preparation of that ground yes. should be on the Saturday night yes. prior to even coming, even to start at the Sunday morning. Very even good. coming to church, what we say, what we think, how we start to, I start to worship and, and to thank Him on the way to church. Not, not, not when I get here, yes. on the way to church. Not Very good. Very good. I think it's a good practice to prepare our hearts for what is to be received. Obviously, the softer, the more tender, the more aerated that soil the better for, for, the, for the seeds of God's Word. So, if you start the night before, or start early that morning, whatever the case, this is why we have prayer right here, first thing in the morning before service. We've always wanted to be able to do that, to have, to have a, a house of prayer. And that's important, isn't it? To prepare hearts. You might say, but I pray anyway, I pray at home. That's okay, wherever you pray, so long as you prepare your heart and make sure that you already set your mind and heart. It's, it's a bit sad when people stay up all hours of the night, Saturday night, uh, I don't know, over the pirating or doing other things that have nothing to do with God, not even the last slightest thought on the things of God, then get up at the last minute, throw some clothes on and turn up at church and then expect to be receptive to God's Word. Chances are it takes a little bit more than that to prepare your heart. Now you know yourself and better than anybody, so I, I guess uh, it's a case of knowing your own nature and how, how you function, but certainly does not... Uh, it, it, it should not be a problem and it should be very encouraging and, and a good necessary thing to prepare a heart for what is covering coming up ahead and, and to, to cover what we receive, to protect it and to have that attitude that says, this is valuable, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to safeguard it. Praise God. The only way we can do this, saints, is if our hearts are soft, permeable, reachable and teachable and we can receive... Uh, from God and therefore keep and treasure the precious seeds of God's Word. I, I think somebody said it this last lesson we had how incredibly precious God's Word is. And uh, we could take time to consider that, but I'm sure that you have done that in your own time. And if you haven't, please do think for a moment just how precious the Word of God is. 
And I'm not talking the physical book that it's written in. I'm talking the words that God has made certain got written by the inspiration of His Spirit. And, and the value that has been put on these words, so much so that lives have been dedicated to its translation. So many, literally, have given their lives. And so that it could be said, those pages literally drip, as it were, with the blood of the very saints that have taken the time and their lives and laid it on the line so that you and I could have the written Word of God. How precious is it to us? And how much do we, do we accept it and, and, uh, and then treasure it in our souls uh, once we receive it? So that's the hard ground that needs to be plowed up. And I pray in Jesus' name that we have done some plowing uh, of that fallow ground if we found any in our lives. But then in verse 5 it says, and it gives us a different uh, setting of, uh, for these seeds. As you can see, uh, the sower continues to sow seed. And it says, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no depthness or depth of earth. And when the sun was up, verse 6, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Now, the portrayal of the stony places here by the Lord is not as some may imagine a situation where there's some good soil with rocks mixed in and you know and sort of overall it's just a bit of little rocks and so forth because even in situations like that if you throw seed although it's a struggle for some of the seeds they seem to find a way to to put roots in good soil and you probably have seen uh, what we would call uh, you know good soil mixed in with stones that can still give forth some reasonable fruit the Greek seems to indicate a different scenario. It indicates more this. The ground that is depicted here has a serious underlying problem. And the problem is underneath. Now, if in the previous situation, we saw a hardness on the top, a searing on top. And the seeds kind of just sat, sat on the top of it there. And we know the solution to that problem is plowing up the fallow ground and breaking it up. But here, the problem is not something that we can see from the surface. In fact, if you looked on the surface, you will see some soil. The problem is that directly under a very, very thin layer of soil, a very shallow layer of soil, is unbroken rock. So in other words, we're talking about rock that's underneath, and then on top of it, a mere cover of just a little bit of soil. That's the situation that we're looking at here. When the Bible says rocky ground or stony places, it's not talking about having little rocks amongst soil. It's talking about having rock under the soil and a little bit of soil on top. Now, with that understanding in mind, you can appreciate why the comments of our Lord in what He said. All right. So, you see, as a result of this condition, the little seed, even though it does take, and all too often takes quickly, it cannot put deep roots down. The roots remain shallow. And as a result, what's, <laughs> what's short roots, or what's a little bit in the roots, then obviously cannot produce a good plant on the top. I guess that's a principle in itself, isn't it? We can only grow above ground in the way that we're growing below ground. It's so true to say that whatever, however we grow on the inside, that's how we can grow outwardly. All right, so what are we talking about here? Well, we might term this, uh, this condition, this hard condition, this soil that is described here, the temporary Christian. The temporary Christian. Jesus said in his explanation of, his, of this aspect of the parable, I believe it's, uh, let's see if I can find it for you. Um, it says that he dureth for a while. He, he just endures for a little bit. Okay. When he explains the, the parable a little bit later, he says, he dureth for a while. So in other words, he doesn't last long. So it's a temporary situation. Now sometimes temporary can mean a few years, but ultimately this individual is doomed to wither away. And we want to just have a look at this condition because sadly, all of us are prone or have the ability to become this type of soil. Now again, please remember that whilst in a general sense, in an evangelistical sense, all too often this parable is used for the disseminating of God's Word into new hearts, hearts that have never received God's Word. It applies to us as believers as well. In fact, it, uh, it's very much so because all the while that we are listening to God, 
uh, growing in God, we are being affected by God's word and we should be affected unless our hearts are not correct or right before him. So, we might term this the temporary Christian because Jesus said he, and he dureth for a while, he lasts for a while. This type of Christian has, what I would say, five stages in his brief stay in the church. And to me, brief can mean anywhere between, well, a few days and a few years, sadly. Now, by the way, we've seen this in churches. You've seen it in, in our church. Some individuals that come in, and don't they get excited about the things of God? It's amazing. In fact, some of them uh, are instantly, you know, receptive of God's Word. They repent quickly. They're baptized. Some are even filled with the Spirit. And then they disappear. It's like it's meant nothing to them. It's like it's, it's made no difference. How can this be? Others have come, they've stayed for a little while, but sadly the evidence seems to show that they're just not growing. They're always staying at that same level. They're simply just, if anything, they over time they grow weaker and weaker and eventually they fade out, they wither away. Similar sort of situation. They endure for a while. They endure for a bit. They last for a while. So there are five stages. I want you to concentrate or think about this with me. Uh, first of all, this individual ascends to God's word. There's no question that he agrees to God's word. He says, "Yes, I, I can, I can see this. I, can, I want it for me." In fact, you can even say he rejoices over God's word. And for a while, and that's the second stage, he professes what he has learnt. So, in other words, it seems at first that the conversion has taken. You know, it can be that this, they, they assent to it and then they profess for a while and they, they seem to practice it. But then, uh, then something else happens. Whilst they're rejoicing in it, and there is a bit of rejoicing, that's probably the third stage, there's a bit of rejoicing, it doesn't last. Soon enough, the fruit that begins to grow in the fourth stage is evidently not a strong fruit. It's not a full fruit. Now, look, I've seen it. I've seen some apple trees that bring forth fruit and instead of the nice big full apple, you get these teeny little shriveled up things. It's fruit, but it's not what you would call really nice fruit at all. It never really matures. If you bite into it, it's extremely sour and it's not the size, the color, the, the shape or the taste that it should be. And so the fifth stage is that it withers away. So, there is an ascent, there is a, an initial um, uh, profession, then there is a rejoicing, and, and there is some fruit, but then there is also a quick withering, a change of direction. And so, those five stages categorize or seem to typify the temporary Christian. As I say, it can happen over a period of days, weeks, months, sometimes even over a few years, but the process is always the same. And, and it's largely because of the underlying condition. I want you to remember the underlying condition. So, let's, let's really sort of focus in on these two underlying conditions that I believe the Bible describes for this type of heart or this type of individual. The two overly, or underlying conditions are, first of all, the hardness under the surface. What do you think this is? What does it represent? I know when we studied the first ground, which was the, the beaten path, we were able to have a look at that. But what do you think this hardness under the surface represents? Yes? A hard heart. A hard heart, yes. It's a hardness of heart. There's no question. But what is this hardness of heart? Yes? You can show the softness and the kindness on the outside, but deep inside it's like the uh, see the rotten bones, and uh, therefore you're hard and your <coughs> inside is very hard even though you're showing the kindness from the outside okay. and making it look um, appealing to the person you're talking to, but yep. officially inside you... Okay, so there is a bit of a facade here, that's what you're saying. On the outside it looks kind of you know, gentle, soft, what have you, but on the inside there's actually hardness. Deb, what would you say? Okay, yeah, we're coming closer with the definition of hardness because this is what we're trying to define. What is this hardness of heart? Yes. <coughs> couple of things like um, probably becoming more critical of the things that, of the word that he received earlier and he's starting to become more critical uh -huh. and also like when Jesus came in Jerusalem and the people worshipped and he said that um, he said, forbid them to say this and he said well if 
the rocks will cry out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, very good. We've hit on one... Uh, uh, please, please keep your thoughts for a moment. I, wa I want to hear more from you. But we've hit on one aspect of what causes this underlying hardness. It's called criticism. Now, please let me, let me remind you, when you first came to the Lord, the first few times, the first early pieces, I can't put a definite time on it because it's different with all of us, but to begin with, you rejoiced over the fact that you met beautiful people. You thought the family of God was amazing, right? Out of this world. That wow! And you were just so enthralled by this. Okay? But, interestingly enough, soon enough, or soon after that, this critical spirit begins to work on you. And you begin to not only find, which is not that difficult because we're all human, but to observe and even concentrate on the flaws of the same people that you thought were so beautiful. And so, it, and it's the same with the things of God. Uh, at first it's so exciting, but then after a while you start to think, oh, well, I have to go to church, or oh, I have to pray. And we begin to look at the negative aspect of that activity or that blessing instead of what it really meant to us from, be, from the beginning. And so this critical spirit is, is creating or is potentially this underlying hardness that was never really yielded to God. Okay, what's another aspect of this underlying hardness that you might have been thinking of? This is very good. Yes, Sean. Sure. Pride. Yes, absolutely. Pride is probably at the core of this underlying hardness. See, when we come to the Lord, what's the, one of the first things we have to do? In repentance, we kneel before God. We are showing a humility of heart by saying, Lord, I recognize I'm a dirty old rotten sinner and I need you. What are you doing? You're humbling yourself. And that should be a symbol that remains with us for the rest of our life. An action that remains with us for the rest of our Christian walk. But sadly, all too often, an underlying pride, either already existing or developing, starts to harden under the ground. On the surface, it still looks okay, but underneath, a pride begins to develop. A pride begins to compact the soil. Or it, there is a definite rock there that should not have, should have been broken, should have been removed. But it isn't. And so because of pride, we limit the depths of soil that is building on top. We just don't allow ourselves to grow. So you see this hardness of heart, pride and criticism. What else? can harden and be underneath that you cannot see readily necessarily. Yes, Julie? Yes, yeah, some of the old nature can remain. In other words, Jesus has cleansed us, but we re reintroduced the old nature. Some of the things that God took off of us and removed, and we were thankful to have removed, but slowly some of the attitudes, the mannerisms, the practices, the habits of the old nature, we reintroduce. And if that happens, there is a rock that's building underneath. You see, this underlying problem is not obvious. In fact, to me, this is a worse condition than the previous one we've studied. Let me put it to you this way. The scripture says, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm. Mm. And that's a worse condition, right? Well, when you think about the soil that's hardened on top, like the path, it's obviously hardened on top, right? That's cold. When you look at the good soil at the other end, you see a soil that's rich and open and receptive. That's obviously hot. But what's in between? In between you've got two conditions that we'll study. One is today, this rocky ground, this underlying rock with a shallow soil on top. And then the next one will be one that's choking up the sea with all sorts of you know, thistles and, and spiky stuff. These are in between. They're not as obvious, but they're obviously there and they do more damage more damage to the word of God because not only do they take the seed but then they as it were cause it to grow a little bit and kill it as it were right when it's doing its its natural growth I, I guess that to me it's worse to see an individual who has accepted Christ begins to walk for a while and then chucks it all away or walks away from it than someone who didn't accept Christ at all to begin with. You might say, but at least they had, had a taste of God. But what, what use is it? When they have despaired against God and they've turned away 
and not appreciated the good things of God. The Bible says that's kind of, that kind of lukewarmness uh, doesn't please God at all. And so this hardness of heart, you see, is an underlying condition. It's not something you see from the top, necessarily. Can you see why we've got to guard ourselves against it? Because having a little bit of soil on top, we can kid ourselves we're doing all right. Look at me, I've got seedlings growing. There's stuff growing. Yeah, but what conditions are there? Did you know that when you grow seedlings, by the way, <clears throat> you don't necessarily replant all the seedlings? Which ones do you replant? The best ones, the strongest ones, right? Why is that? Because they've got the greatest chance of making it. It's the same in this situation. Because of this underlying hardness, unfortunately, a lot of the fruit, most of the fruit that grows in this kind of hard, in this kind of ground, is not, uh, is not solid or it's not strong. It's not well established. And so this pride, this critical spirit, this self-reliance that all too often uh, is the underlying problem, or even the self-promotion. Here's another aspect that will harden underneath. On the surface, there is this desire to appear Christian and do all Christian things, but underneath, just underneath the surface, not very far below the surface, is the self-promotion, to want to be seen of people, to want to be noticed, to want to be voted for, put me in charge. In other words, it's self ultimately, that represents this underlying hardness. Do you remember that when we came to Christ, we decided that we were going to sell self away and we were not going to yield to it anymore? The Apostle Paul said, I crucify myself daily. The self part of it, the flesh part of us, has to die daily. If not, it becomes this underlying condition that renders us useless in true growth. Okay, so that's the first of the two underlying causes. The second cause, and, and we need to watch this first one. You can see that, can't you? You can start with a genuine, humble heart, but hey, you can harden underneath. But the second cause is what the Bible describes a shallowness of soil. The scripture says there in verse 5, please have another look. It says twice, it says that um, it... Um, in verse 5 it says, It fell among stony places where they had not much earth. So there wasn't a lot of earth there. And then a little bit later it says, And forthwith they sprung up because they had no depthness of earth. Twice in a verse it says, There wasn't a lot of soil there. In other words, there was shallowness. There was only a very light cover of soil. And again, I guess you, you are aware that when you plant seeds... Uh, even if you use seedling pots, you need a good depth of soil. You may only put the, the seed on just below the surface in that sense, but it needs that good depth for the roots to form. And if you come back later when the seedling has grown, you will find that the roots have grown, in fact, right through the entire little seedling pot and they've wrapped quite, quite well around and that shows you a good, strong, well-established seedling. What are we saying? Well, we're saying that the shallowness of soil uh, is something that will cause this in the condition of heart uh, or will contribute towards it and it will cause the individual to eventually wither. Now, what do you think represents this shallowness of soil in the, in the, or, or condition of the heart? What, what is the shallowness? We've talked about the underlying hardness, this rock layer, as it were, underneath. But what is the shallowness? What is this shallowness? What does it represent? Yes, Sister Louise. Okay. I, I think that's certainly very, very much in part. In fact, let's say it together. Not enough of God. Say it with me, will you? Not enough of God. Now, think about your life for a moment in terms of time alone, please. Now, I understand that we need to do all sorts of things in our lives, but let's really be judges of this. Is there enough of God in my life? And I don't mean just in, 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 in a general sense. Let's think only of just time, for instance. Think of the time in a week that you spend with God. And if the only time you come up with is when you turn up at church, or when in the morning you quickly grab a few five minutes of prayer, you know, is that enough of God to keep you from being shallow? And that's just time. What about the quality of what we spend with God? 
So when you begin to analyze your life, you can realize that if you don't have enough of God, very quickly that soil will erode away and there's not much debt for the Word of God to grow into. Now we're responsible to make and to receive more of God in our lives every day. We should be deepening that soil. In fact, let me say it to you this way. There are some things, such as some natural pride, some natural things of character, which represent that hard layer, that if you cannot break and crack because it's too thick, the only way you can survive it, listen now, is to build enough soil above it so that the seeds of God's Word can grow. And that's how you bury it. That's how the Apostle Paul did it. He was such a, an incredible temperament, obviously a, an, a, a rather aggressive, uh, choleric type of temperament, and the only way that he could keep that temperament down was to bury it every day. He had a funeral every single day for his flesh. Every day he put that flesh on the cross, as it were, and buried it deep under a thick layer of God. Do you get the meaning? If you can't break that, that rock underneath and remove it, then bury it. Bury it so deep under God that it cannot be found, that it cannot surface, it cannot impede the growth of the seedlings. And I believe that that's the real solution for this condition of the heart. Whereas we can plow up fallow ground, it's harder to remove inbuilt rocks. We have to bury them somehow. But do bury them so deep that finally, finally they cannot affect the growth any longer. I saw another hand at the back here. Brother Peter, yes. Um, Shallowness. Right. And to me, that's a reflection. I guess the link there is the depth of his relationship and his love for God. All right. Yes, yes. I guess he was willing to go this far, but not the rest of the way. And now think about it. You cannot serve God that way. It's simply impossible. With God, we must go all the way. We must be willing to really travel the entire journey. A portion of the journey isn't going to get you there. And so, really, it's the same with this, this condition of the heart. It keeps the individual shallow, uh, you know, no depth. And I think that this is the reason why, ultimately, the roots cannot go deep. They cannot find nutrition. And whatever grows on top is, is withered, is, is sickly. And at best, it's just hardly alive. And unless there is further deepening and care, care taken soon enough, it will wither away. Let, let me show you or share with you one of the things uh, that uh, causes this, um, uh, this, this shallowness. And it's usually this attitude, which I think Brother Peter has just touched on, to have spiritual things in small measure just enough to get by. Oh, well, I, I prayed. But what you mean is you prayed casually just a few minutes and, and it was just a cursory prayer and then you moved on. Uh, you know, you went to church this week uh, once, and and so that was when you read the Word of God. You know, I'm not ha having a go at anybody. I'm just saying that when we have just enough of God, just enough to get by, it's not enough. And I guess what Sister Louise said earlier, we must have more of God. And it has, if it's not enough of God, then this is why we end up shallow on the top. And soon enough, erosion. And boy, doesn't the ground erode away, huh? The, the trials of life have a way of doing that, haven't they? The storms of life. And if soon enough, if there's not enough depth of soil, what happens? Soon enough, the old rock underneath. Because let's face it, we all have some. The old rock starts to creep back up. And it renders anything of the Word of God unable to take root or to grow in any efficient manner. I guess what I'm trying to, con to show you here is that just enough to get by is not enough. If that's how you see God, if that's how you choose to have God and the things of God, then listen, you are headed for withering, dying under the troubles and the tribulations of life. Too little of Jesus and too much of self and the world uh, basically is going to create this condition. 
um, all that is done and said by these individuals that are this way uh, of heart is very surface. It's very showy and superficial, but uh, they don't bear up under real scrutiny. When you begin to look deeply, well, there's just no depth there. So please be careful that you don't become a shallow Christian. In fact, I would dare say that condition of heart is probably one of the most damaging to Christianity than any other. Because what it's saying to the people around us, to the world around us, is that we don't care for God enough to have all of Him. We're just going to select a little bit of what we want that makes us feel happy. Okay? Not enough of God. That's the problem here. Alright, then it says that they forthwith sprung up, and because they had no depthness of earth, no depth of earth, um, they, that's interesting, by the way, that it's all too often when a seed is only in shallow little ground, that it comes up quickly. And it, you almost rejoice, you think, wow, you know, this person is really doing, going places. Look at that. You know, sometimes we despair over people that take a long while, you know, to, to be filled with the Spirit. And, but all too often, they're stayers. And I'm not saying you have to take a long time, and neither that every time it happens quickly, it's bad. I'm not saying that, but at times it happens that way. And people come up quickly and think, oh, wow, you know, this person is really a goer. But then, it doesn't last that way. Because of the depthness of earth. See, we've got to deepen our knowledge, our understanding, and our desire for God. Please, whatever you do, make sure you don't become the shallow Christian. All right, then, the results of this, of the condition of this heart are, are sad. And, and whilst, uh, you know, we, we can imagine how, you know, that must make the Lord feel, uh, He described it this way. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root and they withered away. So these seeds fell in a ground that had no root. And so what was the response? Well, there was a quick response, an excitement to begin with, and I think a new excitement to the new ideas of truth, giving that initial impression of the fast grower. Uh, but soon it becomes evident that the individual is shallow. There is no real desire for deepening knowledge or understanding. There is no real desire to invest time or effort in learning beyond the basic level. Uh, it's a case of, if they've heard it once, yeah, well, I've heard that, don't want, and they tune out. They don't want to know more. They never pick up their Bible to really go deeper unless they're taken there by somebody. You see, I, I like to think that we grow deeper when we individually start to do our own study and we want to really be in prayer and we want to understand God and His Word. That's when you start to really deepen up. And so it's important to have that sort of attitude. So what happens is, as a result of this, well, the, the growth is stunted. Uh, have you ever seen a stunted growth? It's not good. It remains small. And as a rule, it doesn't bring forth the kind of fruit that it should. And if it's a spiritually stunted growth, as a rule, it won't have the ability to do and to be what God wants it to be. God wants us to grow to our full potential. That's God's will. The reason the stunted growth follows is because the roots, the Bible says, are really, well, they're lacking. They're not, uh, uh, they're not the way they should be. And uh, they, these, uh, the roots are not as deep or as, as healthy. And this weak and limited uh, roots will mean that what grows on top is, is also weak and limited and just frail. Okay, and you think, oh, well, okay, so it's a frail plant. So what? I mean, after all, it might still survive. Hang on. There is one other dimension that you cannot escape. And I'm sure if I asked you to put your hand up, all of us would say the same thing, and we'd all put our hands up. And that is called the knocks of life. You see, when you have strong weather coming against you, and you're a healthy, sturdy little plant, you're likely to survive that. But when you're already a weak and frail little plant, you're not likely to survive it. And the Bible describes it this way. And the sun came up. Now tell me, can you stop the sun coming up? And if you can't stop the sun coming up, neither can you stop the difficulties, the heat, the pressure, and the trials and tribulations of life. We all experience them and all will experience them. These knocks of life you cannot avoid. And so it makes a lot of sense if you're going to have to face such difficulties to be building as strong and as sturdy a plant as we can. 
And you can't do that without deep roots, therefore you can't do that without deep soil. Can you see the connection? Ultimately, what is Jesus saying? Well, really, He loves you so much. He wants you to survive. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to go through every storm of life and conquer it. Just like He is desired for you. But you see, unless we deepen our soil, unless we're willing to cover that old rocky ledge, as it were, you know, that rocky, rocky layer with enough of God that it's buried for good and it doesn't interfere with our growth, then unfortunately, those difficulties of life will come upon us and they will begin to try us. The net result, Jesus said, is these seeds that are grown in those conditions so weak, so frail, when the sun came up, withered away. Say withered this morning. Withered. What do you think about? What does it make you think about when you think of the word wither? Dead. Well, not quite dead yet, but what's it? it's a process, isn't it? It's something that's withering, yes. Yeah, okay. First of all, not enough water. That's what I think. It's, it's sort of drying up, yeah? I, I get the picture of the strength of the thing starts to... Do, starts to the structure of it begins yes. to break down. Yeah, okay, okay. Now, okay, you, you're helping here. That's it. Well, anything else that comes to mind? Yes? Nutrients. Yeah, it's not capable to take new, new nutrients. Even if there are nutrients now, it's not capable. All too often you replant these weak little seedlings that have fallen over. You plant them in, but they don't take to the nutrients. Too late. Too little, too late. Yes, Gordon. Uh, well, next recently, I, I had one plant. And you killed it. And I watched the leaves go yellow. Yes. I watched the, the, um, the, the, uh, the branches go, go, go droop over. And although I hoped and although I watered, there was another problem. I mean, my wife understood that. that you know, I ignored her, of course, you know. As far as the plant goes, and uh, and but just watched it, and it, eventually it, it died. It died. Withering gives you this impression of lack of water. Let's talk about that. The Bible says that that we are we, we have been made to drink. And that, that the Spirit of God is living water. In fact, Jesus offered it to the woman at the well, remember? The water that comes from the Lord. A lack of that water, obviously, because you can't take it on board. If there is only shallowness of ground, it doesn't hold the water. The Spirit can be blessing everywhere. But shallow Christians won't retain that blessing. And so there is a lack of water. Somebody else says, okay, it makes me think of the structure actually breaking down. That's exactly what happens. All of the convictions, all the strength that you had in the Lord early in the peace because you, you were growing is, begins to wither and begins to break down. So even the things that you were strong on before, now you're no longer stronger in. Can you see the withering? And now this is one of the saddest things that I've ever experienced in my life is to observe, is to, is to actually notice that there is strength withering, spiritual strength I'm talking about, out of a Christian who could be healthy. It starts with shallowness. The old rock starting to press in and, if you please, appear again because we don't keep depth between us and God. We don't keep that depth. And so, and then finally, I guess in context, uh, you know, there is this, this sort of uh, losing of that of that beauty and there is an, an inability to draw further strength have you noticed that it's the weakest Christians in those conditions when they're so withered that really seem they, they can't be bothered it's like the importance of feeding on God's word or coming to church or being a part of the spiritual fellowship is, is no longer something that they prefer can you see the destruction that's taking place the net result is that that little plant will die. Now, when we're talking a seedling, I guess we, we're sad because a potential growth is, is no longer. But how sad, much sadder it is when it is a person, a believer, a Christian who has experienced the goodness of God, who could have deepened their relationship and become a strong, healthy tree for the Lord. And yet, right here in these earlier stages, have limited their relationship with God so much that given the right conditions of, or the difficult conditions of life, the plant withers and eventually dies. That's not God's will. That's not why God planted the seed in you. He wants full growth. He wants us to grow to maturity. So here I'm going to give you some quick uh, pointers. If you want to jot them down, how do we know that a Christian is withering? How can we tell? Well, let me tell you how you can tell. First of all, he's relying on self and not on God. 
He begins to uh, rely more on himself, on herself. There is a self-confidence instead of a God-confidence. I can do this. I will do this. I'm gonna. Instead of praying and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go about this? Self-confidence takes over from a God-confidence. You can rest assured that's a sign that the individual is beginning to wither. Uh, inability to abide uh, doctrine or soul-searching teaching. Uh, they don't like to hear it. They like to avoid it. In fact, they become convicted and shut off that conviction instead of saying, oh, thank you, Lord. Instead of re- coming with a repentant heart, there is a resistance towards doctrine and towards teaching. If you find your heart doing that any time, thinking, ah, oh, I've wasted time, I should be doing something else, be careful because you're probably withering spiritually. These are early signs that, that the plant is not growing in the depth that it should. The roots have reached... Uh, you know, uh, their the limit. I, I, I think there is a terminology called pot bound. Uh, and that means that the plant above has grown to a place where the roots underneath are no longer to supply it anymore. But really what it's saying is there's not enough depth of earth. And by the way, this can happen to an older Christian too. You can be growing in the same place quite happily in the same little pot, but soon enough, what's above has grown beyond what the roots underneath can supply. Well, what do you do there? What do you do in a pot bound plant? Repot it! And usually you pot it in a bigger pot. Give it more soil, more depth. In other words, at whatever stage of your walk with God you are, you can grow deeper. That's the message from God, unless you want to wither and die. In fact, isn't that the message, really, that God says all the way? That we need to continue to grow. This is an ongoing process. So, the fact that you have happily grown in your little pot doesn't mean that you're beyond this heart condition. Okay, and the next thing that can happen is that another sign that the Christian is reading is that the conscience is no longer tender and receptive to God's Spirit. The Spirit of God moves. And instead of feeling that joy, that thrill and participation in the, in the move of God's Spirit, there is this sort of resistance. There is a hardness, and there is that rock coming up again, isn't it? Okay? So, there is a conscious level here that is an indicator that there is a withering taking place. Here is another very strong indicator. Prayer life becomes just a token. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed are our bodies. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's see. There is no real thought behind the prayer anymore. There is no real desire to pray. And even when when there is a prayer because of needs, it's only just for the needs and then it's forgotten. Prayer becomes a only when you have to type of situation. Be careful. These are all signs of the withering Christian. Another sign is an inability to stand against or firm, to stand firm against temptation. Where in the past there was an ability to stand strong and say no to that which the devil tempts us with. Now there is this consideration. Hmm. I wonder if anybody's watching. Maybe I can get away with this. Be careful. When you are tottering on temptation, instead of a firm, direct, no, I love the Lord too much for this, then you are displaying a sign, potentially, of a withering Christian. And lastly, there is a deadness of spirit that starts to take place. Um, I hate it when I turn over and I sleep on my arm, and then I, and I realize my arm is dead. Have you had that experience? Alright, so what are we saying? Look, in closing, I just wanted to, to close with this, that, that ultimately this deadness of spirit comes in. And it's a definite sign of the withering Christian. Let me describe it to you. The joy is departed. The glory is departed. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying there? Do you relate? Unfortunately, sometimes we feel that way. And the blessing of God is no longer felt, nor is it as important. Whereas in the, in the early stages, we were just so joyful and just blessed to be in God's presence. Blessed to be amongst God's people and, and in worship. And now that joy just, just isn't there. That, that something that, that used to keep us just vibrant and, and literally shaking in excitement almost and, and just wanting to be with God's people, with God's Word, with the things of God. It's just that deadness of spirit saying that, that dead arm feeling is an indicator that we are withering. Wake it up! 
Don't keep sleeping on it because as long as you keep it that way, circulation isn't happening. That little plant is weak, it's frail. And when a temptation comes and you're in that weakened condition, you can rest assured you will wither and die. And God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for any of us. All right. And so, I I want you to think about these things as we close here. I've run out of time. I want to close right there. We'll review a little couple of those things maybe this next Sunday, Lord willing. But just remember that this condition of the heart, unlike the the soil that was hardened on top, you know, that was just sort of trodden on and can be plowed up, the result, or, or shall we say the solution for this condition, is deepening our relationship with God. Deepening how much of God we have. Now, can you ever say you've got enough of God? So therefore, there is room for growth. You've heard me say it many times, there is room for growth. There is room for deepening. Deepening my knowledge. Deepening my relationship. Deepening my understanding. Deepening my desire for God. And when I do, I'm allowing more space above that old rocky self, old nature that that sometimes likes to creep up and keeping it buried where it belongs. Six foot under is safe. Get a good six foot of ground between you and the old flesh. Amen. Make sure it's good soil. And you know what? You'll be a thriving Christian. But let that soil diminish and the old rock will appear again and will kill any seedling, any plant that is trying to grow there. Alright. Will you stand with me here today? Are you receiving anything from these lessons? Is it, is it speaking to your hearts? Let's pray that we are able to receive from the Lord through this. Amen. Uh, praise God. All right. Well, let's bow heads in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us. Uh, Brother Peter Rascal, can I ask you to close this study in prayer, please?